Uh, if reference wavelength is activated, should the spectra range include the reference wavelength too? If not, what will happen? I'm going to walk over to my laptop and I'm going to flip it over to ChemStation and share that with you and hopefully answer the question. So let me take you in here and show you um, uh, show you that and also uh, show you a little more about the LC software. So what I'm running is uh, Agilent LC ChemStation. The uh, official version of this is called B.0403. And... Um, it is, I believe, still the most popular version out there. It's outdated, officially. I think they stopped making this eight or 10 years ago. Uh, it's still a lot of our a lot of our favorite. So I have uh, ChemStation loaded on the laptop, and I'm running, uh, like I said, this is, um, uh, it's not connected to an LC, so you'll notice that it thinks there's a power failure. You notice all the modules are red. Yeah, sorry about that. I guess I could have taken one more further step and connected this to a real LC, but maybe maybe in the future. So in this one, you can see the uh, uh, the software. Um, this is the method of run control screen. So that's the auto sampler, pump, column, and detector. This is the software, integration, quantification, report generation, but this is the hardware itself. And this question has to do with reference wavelength. So if you go to the dot array, so I'll click on the dot array and uh, look at the method information. In this case, uh, boy, I could spend a day and a half just talking about this screen all by itself. So come to my hands-on class and uh, buy me a beer and I'll stick around afterwards and I'll spend it on spend at least an hour and a half talking about the screen. But there's a lot of information here, but let me simplify this for you. The top part of the screen, up here, where it says signals, um, this is the, uh, the wavelength that we want to use for our chromatography. So in this case, the most popular wavelength, 254, uh, works great for anything that has an aromatic ring. Um, all the other stuff, a little more into it. The bandwidth is the plus or minus nanometers. So instead of just looking at 254, we're going to do 254 plus or minus 8 nanometers. Why do we do that? Well, it goes into the, you know, study a little bit about UV spectra. They're very broad. Uh, this gives us uh, uh, improved sensitivity, improved single-to-noise ratio. So that's what the bandwidth is. Don't overthink it. Set it to 16. Leave it alone. Don't ever think about it again. Or do the deep dive and, and sit through one of my long videos on where I explain what that, all that means. So that's sample bandwidth. Reference wavelength. So uh, believe it or not, your dot array detector is subtracting whatever's in the reference uh, area. It's subtracting that from what's in the sample. So your sample signal, data point for data point, you know, 80 times per, se per second, it's taking a data point from the signal and subtracting from it this reference. So it goes out to 360 plus or minus 50, right, with 100 nanometer bandwidth. And it's averaging all that. And whatever that average is, it's going to subtract it from the average of these 16 at 254. So what it's really doing is what's out there, there's nothing out there, or there should be nothing out there, um, but that is uh, um, noise. So it could be lamp noise, refractive index noise. Um, those are equivalent across all wavelengths. So here's a cool idea. Let's go to a high wavelength where our sample should never absorb, and let's subtract that from where our sample is absorbing, and then we can subtract all the noise. Works great for 99% of the people, Occasionally, if you get a negative peak, so I mentioned this in the uh, in answer to one of the other questions, if you ever get a negative peak with a diode array detector, um, the easy answer is to shut off the reference. So if you go over here and just shut that off, it will not use a reference at all. Um, you would never get a negative peak again if you're doing your diode array detector. Uh, what it's what was happening is you have something that was actually absorbing up there, probably a, a very uh, colored compound, a green or red or purple uh, compound, and it was absorbing uh, up there at, at the 360 range. So that's easy answer. Now, direct answer to this question. Um, notice the way Agilent does this. They separate your signal, what you're doing for chromatography and integration quantification from the spectrum. So the answer to your question is no, you don't have to include it. In fact, you don't have to, by default, you're not even collecting spectra. That's just shut off. So these are two separate things. The one is your chromatogram, and that's your A through H. So technically you could collect eight chromatograms. I don't suggest doing that unless you really have eight different wavelengths you want to collect. I usually choose one at most two wavelengths that you're looking at. And then down here, I always store all. No reason to ever not store data 
uh, nowadays. The amount of data it takes up, the, the amount of hard space, uh, uh, hard drive space is, is minuscule. We're talking maybe, you know, one or two megabytes for an entire file. So it's a minuscule uh, sizes if you collect all. So in this case, it's going to collect all the UV spectra. Uh, every tenth of a second for this setting, every tenth of a second, it's going to take a UV spectra from 190 to 400 in two nanometer steps. That's the default. That's pretty good. Uh, I mean, that to me is great because it covers the entire UV. If you're looking at colored compounds, if your compounds are pretty green and red, all red and yellow and purple, um, then you need to go above 400 nanometers and you can take this guy up to 700 or actually up to 900 and depending on which instrument you have, uh, but that'll get you up into the visible as well. But for most of us, uh, most compounds do not absorb in the visible, but they do absorb in the UV. So the answer to your question, I know the reference wavelength does not need to be included in the spectrum because it's uh, collecting this, it's collecting that separately, and all 1,000 diodes, there's actually 1,024 diodes, they're all on all the time. It's just which ones it's talking to, which ones it's, it's listening to. Okay, um, so I do have another question that, uh, oh, so a lot of interest in peak purity or a lot of interest from the same person in peak purity. So I will, it's written in different ways. So I assume it's more than one of you that have uh, this interest. So peak purity is, um, wow, how do we do this? So if you have a data file, you can look at the UV spectrum across a peak and that will tell you whether or not it's a pure peak. Really what it's doing is it's doing what's called the similarity uh, curve. So let me go to data analysis and I need to load a data file. So in my demo, uh, demo data file, there is a file called Demodad. It's my favorite file, right? It's like the demonstration dad, Demodad. So Demodad is an old data file. It comes with every chem station in the world. So anytime you, if you ever have uh, chem station software or open lab or anything like that, you'll find this Demodad. It's funny, look at the file information. See when it was actually generated in uh, 1985. Oh, that's before all you guys were born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was actually alive. I was actually doing LC with the diet array back in 1985. So this could have been mine. No, it was not mine. Uh, but here's why I like it. There's lots of peaks and there's lots of spectra. So let me simplify this. We're going to look at one chromatogram. So this is our chromatogram. There happens to be polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. And um, uh, behind each one of these is UV spectrum. So the thing about this is it's three dimensional. We're only looking at two dimensions. But if I go over here and put in my spectral tool belt and I grab my fancy little spectral tool, and that means show me the spectrum wherever I point. And I point and it shows me the UV spectrum. So the thing about this is the fingerprint. There's a molecule, there's a compound that's coming off there. Um, and it has a fingerprint, and this is the fingerprint of that molecule. So each of these molecules has its own fingerprint. Ooh, look at that one. That's interesting, right? And this guy has a different fingerprint. Oops. Different fingerprint. Oops, I think I've lost my ability. There we go. So what you're seeing here is uh, we have uh, different fingerprints, different molecules. Now, if this is a pure compound, the fingerprint should be the exact same across the entire peak. So if I look at the spectrum at the beginning, middle, end, they should all be the same. So let me show you my, I call this the poor man's peak purity tool because we can understand what it does. If I click on a peak, it's going to give me five spectra across the peak, equally spaced. It's going to overlay them. And if they all overlay, then that is a pure peak. Well, what, what it really means is that peak is the exact same beginning, middle to end. So see how all five of these overlay? I don't know if you can tell, but those are five lines on top of each other. So if I do this and start blowing this up, you're going to realize, oh my gosh, if those are five spectra on top of each other, it looks like one. So that is a pure peak. So I click on a peak. It'll show you um, its purity based on, we can look at it and, and tell by the overlays. So there's another peak in this chromatogram that's horribly impure. Um, it's this peak right here. I know that because I've done this before, but I can't tell by looking. I mean, what do we do? We look at symmetry. So I I'll look at the symmetry of this peak. Um, and if I zoom in on the peak, uh, it is perfectly symmetrical. So let's use my poor man's system suitability, or I'm sorry, my, my poor man's tool for looking at peak purity. And I want to ask your opinion. Are those five complete overlays or do we see some differences? 
Yeah, we see some big differences. This is an impure peak. This is actually two peaks on top of one another. Um, and how can we tell? Because all five things don't overlay. Okay, so hopefully I've just sort of explained uh, what that tool does. And now your question was specifically, how do you set up peak purity and threshold? So that's how we manually do peak purity. Peak purity is based on uh, how pure the compound is compared to what the threshold is. So what is a threshold? Go to calibration. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go to spectra. Go to spectral options. Go to purity. I'm sorry, mine is slow because I'm sharing my screen with you guys. Go to purity. And by default, it'll calculate the threshold. And boy, don't ask me what it's doing there. It's doing a complex calculation. I always describe it as it looks at the first 10 seconds of your chromatogram, assumes there's no peaks there calculates the standard deviation of the noise, does a multiple of that and says, your peaks should be better than this. The problem with calculating threshold is if you have a really clean mobile phase and a really good lamp and everything else, it may calculate, a, I've seen thresholds that'll calculate out of a thousand, 999.8 out of a thousand. So if you get a 999.7, it'll call that impure. Okay, my easy answer, I usually just choose the fixed threshold. Um, I like consistency. The calculate threshold will be different every day. You need to do the deep dive on this and decide what's right for you. But for me, for most of the time, I'm just looking for, do I have a great big thing underneath my peak or am I pretty much good to go? So that's, I like doing it. And that's where you're going to find your threshold stuff um, is here to either calculate or, or fixed. Um, yep, hopefully that answers your question. I am back. So, uh, oh, what are my glasses on? Yes. There we go. They're just for cosmetic purposes. I don't need them really to read. We're going to be fixing instruments and doing videos. So send us suggestions. Uh, we love to hear from you guys.